Scott County, providing safe, healthy, and livable communities. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, we are delighted this morning to have a large group of folks available to talk with us about specialty courts. Um, and Captain Haas and I um, from the Sheriff's Department are going to um, start off some questioning. We certainly invite you to jump in as you wish, um, but we will leave time at the end for the Commissioner's questions. Um, I'd like to have the um, panelists introduce themselves in just one second. Uh, but first I want to remind you that the specialty court is on your agenda once a year and we have brought this back partly to monitor it when it was on a grant. Now it is no longer on a grant and we continue to monitor how this program impacts uh, recidivism in our communities. Um, it's a great example of bringing together services um, to address a high needs high risk population as a way to reduce recidivism and really is an example of the things we like to see in terms of working across departments and working with community partners. Um, last year, you encouraged us to bring forward more outcome data and so you're gonna see a little more of that this year. And in the process of preparing for today, we've had conversations about further development. So more this year, more to come next year. The last things I want to just point out before we um, turn it over to the panelists. Um, is this. So. Have some help. I'm gonna work through it. Yep. Did you get the screen you want, or we need to? Nope. I need a, I need the back end screen. Do you need to go to? I need to go back one. Oh, there you go. Yeah, just use Thank the roll. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. So, I just want to share really quickly just some community level data. Um, this is uh, the the um, crime rates for our most serious crimes, the part one crimes. Those are largely crimes against people, they're more serious. And you can see that really this data shows a, a trending downward of those most serious crimes at both the county and the state level. Um, this is a, uh, the data for the, what's called part two crimes. Those are largely property crimes or less serious crimes, unless you're the victim and then they feel pretty serious. Um, and you can see that there's a little more vacillation in that um, in the county level data. State rates for that are not yet available from the Department of Public Safety. Um, so with that sort of setting of serious crime, property crimes, today we're gonna to talk about reducing recidivism in both those categories. I'd like to ask our in-person panel members to introduce themselves first, um, starting with Molly. Okay, Molly Bruner, Director of Community Corrections. Good morning, I'm Judge Chris Wilton uh, here in Scott County. Sergeant Jamie Pearson uh, with Shackley Police Department. All right, then I'd like to ask the presenters on the, who are appearing remotely to introduce themselves, and I'd like to start with Heidi. Hey, Heidi Kastma, Coordinator for Veterans and Treatment Court. And because of our remote environment, Heidi, would you be willing to introduce the rest of the folks or to at least cue them to introduce themselves? Yeah, I will just kind of cue over to the um, to Judge Lennon and then we can work down from attorneys and go from there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Judge Gary Lennon. I work on the treatment court, um, drug treatment court with Judge Wilton and I back him up on veterans court. Thank you and Mr. Bryce. My name is Bryce Herman from the County Attorney's Office. I serve in both our treatment court and our veterans court, and I've been doing so for approximately two years now. I'll turn it over to Alan Anderson from the County Attorney's Office. Good morning, everybody. I am Alan Anderson. I am one of the prosecutors in veterans court, and I am Bryce's backup for the drug court. And I think we'll turn it over to Kevin now, our defense attorney. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us. Kevin Weatherill, uh, defense attorney in the uh, Veterans Court uh, program. And I think we've got Michelle Barley on here. I'll turn it over to Michelle. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, Michelle Barley. I'm with the Public Defender's Office. I am the defense attorney for the treatment court, one of them. And I can't see who else is here to I got it, them. Michelle. Thanks. Uh, Matt Schultz, please. Uh, good morning, Matt Schultz. I supervise the clients on the Betts Court team. Uh, Katie. Um, Katie, we are not able to hear you. Uh, if you might want to check that mic. Uh, Dr. Schult. Jamie McNaught. Are you guys hearing me, Michelle? Okay, thank you. Margaret Newman. Hi, my name is Margaret Newman. I work at the VA and I serve on the veteran treatment court team. Thank you. All right, Captain Haas, you ready? Let's go. All right. Um, I'd like to start. The first question um, I'd like to ask, I'd like to direct to Heidi and Heidi Katsuma, who is the coordinator for both programs. Um, and I'd like to ask you to do just a brief um, summary of the evaluation that was done on treatment court this year. Sure. Yes, so we were fortunate to be able to get an evaluation done um, and we had some key findings from it. Um, so right now, some of the things that came out from it is they did a comparison group. So they looked at people with similar um, risk and need to those we serve in treatment court. Um, and it was determined that 45% of those people not in treatment court obtained new offenses while under supervision compared to 10% that were in treatment court. Um, those that were not in treatment court were three times more likely to have warrants issued for non-compliance on supervision than those involved with treatment court. And then they found some key um, factors associated with success in treatment court. And those would be those that had a minimum of a diploma or GED upon entry into treatment court tended to be more successful. If you were employed at program exit, if you were able to rent or own your own um, residence at program exit, and if you spent at least 61 days or more in treatment, you were more likely to be successful in treatment court. Um, some information we also got from the evaluation that's not as tangible, but it's stuff that was reported from participants in the program um, for feedback on what they thought and felt helped them. Um, there are strong agreement among participants um, that treatment court would help them avoid future drug use and criminal behavior. Um, they reported it helped improve relationships, self-esteem, and overall quality of life. They reported that regular probation appointments helped keep them accountable. And they felt the judge is different than other judges because the judge was more helpful instead of punishing. And they felt strongly that regular court appearances and drug testing helped them stay sober. Thank you. As, as a follow-up to that question, I'd like to go to the very last page of the packet where it has some life factors. And some of these are reflected in the, the variables of success that you just talked about. Um, could you walk us through this data slide, Heidi? Sure. Um, so if you look at the left, um, the before, that's going to be all the graduates. So upon entry, um, only three graduates were employed when they came into treatment court. Um, upon discharge, um, 17 of those 21 graduates were um, fully employed or students. Um, some that we did have a couple of stay at home mothers. Um, housing, upon entry, only 10 of them had stable housing. And upon graduation, all 21 had some form of stable housing. Uh, with driver's license for 21 graduates, 12 of them had a valid driver's license upon entry. And then at the time of graduation, 20 out of the 21 had a valid driver's license. Um, as you can see for education, kind of noted what came out in the evaluation, um, all 21 of our graduates either had a diploma or GED upon entry. And then obviously at exit, they also still had that education level. So if you look at the right column, that's gonna be the people that terminated or did not successfully complete the program. Um, employment for those people, four at entry did have some form of employment, and at the time of discharge, only three had a form of employment. Housing, six had stable housing at time of entry, and then at time of discharge, only three had stable housing. 
driver's license upon entry for those that didn't successfully complete 11 um, had a valid driver's license out of the 23 and no other participants um, obtained a valid driver's license during that time so it remained 11 and then education 17 out of the 23 had either a diploma or GD and then again um, the same 17 at discharge and no new participants at that time got further education. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, either Heidi or someone from the, the panel, uh, can we talk about how the program helps the participants with these factors? So what uh, what's the involvement of uh, the court process and in, in making a change in these people's lives? How does that how does this change happen? I, I can take that or someone else can. I, I can start and then other team members can kind of interject. So throughout the program, um, it is a requirement um, for them to work towards education, driver's license and employment. We have those kind of goals broken down during phases. Um, we help with driver's license. Our attorneys are great um, at helping navigate the driver's license system for them, helping if they need to get court dates for things. Um, our county attorney's office has even been willing to work um, with some offenses to get them dismissed or a fine paid so they can get their driver's license back. Um, we've referred to GED programming um, through the Workforce Center and community agencies. Um, we have utilized yeah. Workforce Center. Um, law enforcement has even stepped in and helped people with job referrals and things like that. So we use a very team approach and everyone assists in these areas um, in ways that can help these people get um, their driver's license education and those sort of things. Heidi, because the um, evaluation indicated some other variables that are linked to success in this program, would you envision tracking some of those data elements as well? So I'm thinking about number of days in treatment, few yep. um, uh, positive UAs, um, those kinds of things. Yes, yeah, so we okay. do track um, treatment time for participants, both um, residential and outpatient treatment. Um, and we do track, um, you know, their housing status. We track UAs for all of them. So that's certainly data we can continue or um, include in presenting in future presentations on overall days and, and treatment and everything like that as well. Thank you. Um, I have a question on housing, if I could. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned housing, uh, either for those that were uh, successful or those that were terminated, what? What kind of housing? Is there supportive housing in any, any kind? I know there's like, for example, nonprofits that have housing for transitional housing for jail reentry or, you know, reentry from jail into the community. What kind of housing were you talking about here? Yeah, so stable housing is considered either if they rent or own their own apartment or place, or if they, some of our participants who are younger who are living stably with a family member long term. Do you ever make a, well, do you ever make a determination that they need um, a more, more supportive housing with some accountability as part of the housing? Do you ever, uh, is that part of the program or, or not necessarily? Yeah, typically that sort of supportive housing would come from continued treatment. So a lot of our participants will start in a residential program and then it's determined returning home isn't the best environment for them at that time. So they'll be referred to like an outpatient with lodging that has some accountability and support there. Um, and even after that, some are referred to sober housing um, where it's a more supportive environment and there might be a sober house manager there and other forms of accountability. So it really varies on the participant needs and kind of their step down um, process. Thank you. As, as I look at this slide, this is Commissioner Beard. Um, two things jump out at me. One is housing and the other is driver's license. Uh, some things that we pay a lot of attention to in, in the policy world. Um, can you tell me, uh, is housing, um, there are the people that, that are in treatment court that are succeeding, are they succeeding because they have housing or do they have housing because they're succeeding? And if I look over on those that, that washed out, um, are they, do they, <coughs> did they fail because they don't have housing or is, are they don't have housing because they're failing? Uh, to clean up their lives. And the same question could go for driver's licenses. The ability to move themselves around probably is directly related to their ability to hold a job 
uh, the same kind of questionnaire. Have you have do you have any data on that or any observations on what's the cause and what's the effect? That would help us a great deal. I think it's somewhat twofold. Um, for the people that aren't doing well, um, sometimes they burn the bridges with housing, either with family. Um, the people that tend not to complete the program are struggling with complying with treatment and getting sober and staying on track. So a lot of the times their housing is ruined because they've now absconded. Um, they're on warrant status. Um, they're not staying anywhere stable. So um, it's part twofold because um, one, they're using. Um, so you don't know if it's because they're not in a stable house with someone or if it's just their use. Um, and that would kind of be the same for the graduates. Um, a lot of times you'll see because they're doing well, family allows them back in the home. They're able to work with um, an agency to get housing. They're able to secure a job to have the money to pay for housing. So, I mean, if I had to make a guess, it's gonna be more on their ability to stay sober and comply with um, programming and the services they need. Commissioner, what I'll add is, is that um, you, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of two very important pieces here. Um, I can tell you that when they don't have stable housing, they are not going to be successful. And as you've indicated, if they don't have a driver's license, generally speaking, they can't work. I didn't know how hard it was to get your driver's license back. It seemed so easy <clears throat> when you were 16 to mm -hmm. go and take your permit and then magically that day arrives where you have some freedom. But once you lose that license, mm -hmm. it's extremely difficult to get it back. And when you put up COVID on top of that and the services, et cetera, um, yeah. it's extremely, extremely difficult. I think we always struggle with the housing piece. Um, I tell my participants, as Judge Lennon does, you know, we can put them in the greatest treatment, we can give them the greatest probation officer, and we can send them away and get them fixed to where they need, you know, to be. They have a good head on their shoulders, their brain is clear. And then what we do is we pop them right back in the same exact spot that they were four months ago. And nobody's shocked to find out that they start hanging around the same people. It's not stable housing. People move in and out of there. Drugs move in and out. And then we have relapse. And so, you know, a lot of our sober houses, we have people that are in Shakopee or Shakopee residents who are in St. Paul or spread out all over basically the state of Minnesota for treatment and for sober housing. It's definitely one of the pieces that we're missing in Scott County um, is, is kind of that stable housing piece. Um, but our probation officers do a great job. Uh, they work hard at making sure that these participants get to um, look for stable housing. Our veterans, of course, are a little bit different because they have the ability at times to get vouchers, um, but even that's difficult. Uh, I have one veteran who yesterday was kicked out of his treatment facility, and he's not homeless. Um, he literally has nowhere to go. And so Matt Schultz has been working since yesterday and the rest of the team to get him some stable housing. Because what I know about him is if he doesn't have stable housing, he's going to use and the cycle begins again. Yeah. I, if I could make one comment as well, I think one additional thing that's been really hard for some of our participants with families is finding housing in Scott County or family, family type apartment, like multi bedroom apartment dwellings that will allow people with past criminal convictions to um, yeah. be able to rent. That has been a, a pretty big problem as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, ju Judge, offline, we should talk about the uh, driver's license thing and how difficult the legislature's made it. Uh, for people who have screwed up to actually get um, get a driver's license back again. But that's probably beyond the scope of this discussion, but I'd be happy to chat about it uh, over coffee when this pandemic dies down. Perfect. I'll take you up on that, Commissioner. Judge, okay. One more question. And it's not just singles, correct? I mean, if, I, if I could chime in just a little bit on the driver's license, uh, right. Commissioner Beard. Um, I think that's a tremendous barrier for clients, at least from the veterans court standpoint, to getting into the program even. Um, we've had participants who their offenses are related to driving, they lose their driver's license, and we require them 
to, for example, drive to the Marshall Road Transit Station to drug test multiple times a week as part of the program or they're in violation and they get sanctioned. And, you know, my role, I have to tell them that at the beginning, along with their defense attorney, because if they can't get from point A to point B, they'll fail in the program and they won't have a chance from the beginning. So I think um, that's a big one. Um, I agree with Judge Wilton's comments on housing. Um, the veterans court clients at least are, tend to be spread out all over the place at times because uh, the housing is such a challenge here locally for them for all the reasons they've stated. So Judge, I just wanted to ask too about, you know, sometimes we talk about the vets and as single adults or the people in treatment court, but we're also dealing with families too that need. Absolutely. And, and as uh, Kevin just uh, talked about, you know, if you have a felony on your record, um, nobody wants to rent to you. It, it, our participants get turned down over and over and over. And these are moms with kids. These are dads with kids. Um, it is super, super difficult to find any housing in Scott County. Um, you know, that, that is a challenge. It's a challenge for our vets. It's a challenge for our drug court people. And again, I would tell you that if they do not have stable housing, they are not going to succeed. Um, so it, it, is it the chicken and the egg? Yes. But, you know, imagine sleeping and staying in your car. And if that's your, if that's your home, um, the rest is you worry about where you're going to park at night, whether you're going to be safe, whether your stuff's going to be stolen, um, as opposed to all of us who presumably go home and lock our door and we have a solid foundation to start with. Um, it's, uh, it's a problem and, and it, it's a barrier to success for sure. Did, did, did that have that as well? oh. Sorry, do we have data on just in, and maybe even not data, but but just your uh, impressions on, in general, how many of the participants of these courts have minor children? Heidi, do you know off the top of your head? I, I mean, I can think about mine. I know. Um, well, whether they have current custody or not, I would say anywhere um, from 40 to 50% of our participants have children. Great. Thank you. That and helps. in that small children, I mean, it small children and a number of our drug court participants um, have actually had babies while they were participating and continue to participate in in treatment court yep we've had five healthy sober babies born um, from participants and then we've had some male participants um, whose significant others um, have had babies as well so we probably have about seven or eight total but five of our actual participants gave birth to sober babies and that's created some different partnerships, yes? Um, at, at the beginning of treatment court back years ago, um, we had worked hard at a link between children's services and treatment court, and, and I know that there's some new partnerships that exist now. Can someone talk about that? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing when you start from ground zero in a treatment court or a veterans court. Um, you, your, your focus is scattered. Um, you kind of have to go through, make mistakes, uh, as we've had, um, to get better at what we do. And so um, we've had a, a, a good relationship with Lisa Brodsky and, and public health in the past, and um, kind of on a smaller scale. And Judge Leonard and I have had a chance to talk to Lisa um, and are super excited about kind of a new partnership where we have somebody from um, Scott County Public Health who's now going to come and sit, right now virtually, um, in our treatment court. And so uh, Angie was on yesterday and uh, introduced herself to all of my treatment court people. Um, the wraparound services, again, you know, we have all these new moms and dads, for that matter, um, who need that public health piece. Um, this is. This is one of those, as Heidi talked about, having five sober babies. I don't know how to show you statistically what that's going to save the county this year, next year, or in the, in the following years. But to have sober babies that um, are not in child protection and are healthy medically, et cetera, um, it's just exponential. Not only is it great for the human being and to give this young child a chance, uh, at ground zero, 
but cost savings is immense. And so uh, Angie from uh, Public Health has now uh, spent two weeks in court uh, virtually, and um, she is uh, working with a number of our participants, including one of our young uh, pregnant moms. Um, and our goal now is, is to get the dads involved. We have young dads who um, are not living with these children, and yet when they get little Johnny for a Saturday and he cries or she cries, they don't know what to do. They've never been trained to be a dad, and they've missed out on so many portions of that, you know, that learning experience. And so um, it's, uh, you know, we, we took a look at within. This doesn't cost us any money. Um, it costs us time and energy and effort, but to have public health now more involved with our participants right away in drug court um, is, uh, I'm excited about it, and I know uh, Judge Lennon is, and, and Lisa Brodsky is also. I want to move to page 12. Uh, so this chart and uh, numbers below talk about uh, the different racial breakdown of the participants of the program. Uh, and we do this to uh, identify if there's any disparities. Looking at the raw numbers, it, it looks like there, there are disparities. So can someone talk about what's the story behind that data? And why, why do we see the numbers uh, in this format? And what, what are some of the challenges or opportunities behind that? Yeah, um, so I can speak to that. So this would be um, from, you know, our percentages for all the people referred um, and kind of how it breaks down. Um, just to give you some comparison, how it compares to Scott County probation for those um, assigned to a probation officer. So it'd be a similar risk and need level to what we have. Um, currently, our Scott County overall population is 81% white, 5% Hispanic, 4% African American, 6% Asian, 1% Native American, and 3% multiracial. So we're somewhat aligning um, with our Scott County probation demographic, but there is definitely a disparity in who we are serving in our program. Um, I have volunteered to be um, on a state um, work group um, to identify equity, race, and inclusion in treatment courts. So we're currently utilizing a tool um, so we can pull all of our information from our treatment court program, put it into the system and kind of see where we're falling short. So that's a work group and something we're going to be focusing on to make sure that we are more inclusive in our program. If I could say one thing, I, I really feel that one of the reasons that we don't have inclusion equal across the board is because of past criminal history. And I've pointed that out a couple of times, and I know that Mr. Ehrman and I have had this discussion before, but I do believe that it's the eligibility criteria that also lends to the um, discrimination. And I was gonna say this about I can add to that in terms of some of the things we've done to try to change or address that is prior to when we were under our federal grant funding, we were very limited in terms of the types of offenses we could actually take into treatment court. Uh, after our grant funding ran out, we looked to kind of address this issue head on and modify some of the criteria as to who is coming in based on offense history. Um, we're really at this point narrowing down pretty significantly to offenders that, um, you know, if they have issues of murder, manslaughter, uh, sex trafficking, uh, arson, uh, some very serious crimes, they're going to be deemed ineligible for our program because we've got some pretty significant public safety concerns. Uh, what was previously limiting a lot of folks was uh, prior felony offenses related to assaults. And we've limited that now to if there's an assault within the past five years. And I'll just say, it's something we're continuing to evaluate from the county attorney's office. Our perspective is it's a delicate balance in who we accept into the program uh, from the public safety perspective in the first place. Uh, some of our referrals are presumptive prison commits. And as a result of that, we need to think really hard about what impact that has to public safety uh, if we're having uh, these individuals enter the program. Another thing that we've switched in the past year is really work to get to know who these individuals are 
uh, before they enter our program. One really great thing Heidi has done has actually developed in terms of a referral sheet before we used to get essentially a name and an offense. Doesn't tell us a lot about that person, right, and who they are. Uh, but now Heidi's developing a narrative when she interviews these individuals as to why they want to be in the program. Uh, because what we're looking for is what is something substantial or compelling that otherwise is going to overcome what the law says normally, which is that this person is a presumptive prison commit. We're having some real um, honest and challenging discussions about who's the best fit for this program uh, based on looking at some of this data and, and what's right for our citizens. Thanks, Bryce. Molly, you were going to make a comment. Yeah, no, thank you, Bryce. I think that you covered some of the things I was going to mention. I was just also going to say that, Heidi, you spoke to kind of the statewide trends. This is also, also national trends, so it's not unique to Scott County. Um, and so we'll be looking at all of that data as it pertains to continuing to examine, again, what we're doing here in Scott County. So in, in addition to all of the things that have been mentioned. So, so quick question, and I know this is always um, touchy, which is why we should take it head on. Um, so the context of this is like we should always go into everything with our eyes wide open with whatever it is. But a couple, I was walking across the room, so maybe I missed it. But are we saying that in our heart of hearts, we believe it's more circumstantial that some of these things are, are, are the way they're panning out versus like full on discriminative? And maybe we don't need to. I, I, just, I think, can I, can I answer? That? Sure. Do you yeah. mind, Commissioner? Um, I think what we're saying is that people are having different experiences in our treatment court and we need to learn more about that. And um, the speakers talked about it may be past criminal history. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think anybody is um, speaking to some um, um, prejudice, some active prejudice, but there are factors in our criminal justice system that um, may be impacting that and we need to learn more. If people are having different experiences, we want to know about that. Absolutely, and that seems completely reasonable. And, and like again, we need to always have our eyes wide open to everything. Yep. Um, but I, I also, you know, sometimes I'm not saying that this is one of those times, but you can get caught into a narrative that it's like, well, wait a minute, like what's real and what's not real. Yeah. Like let's can we be honest about that? Uh, yep. And if there's things that need to change, let's change them. Like of course. Right. Uh, I just want to be, and I'm not saying that this is that time, but it just, yeah. I don't want to get stuck into some weird narrative that is the trend of the day. And it's like, it's always right, right to do right. It's always right to do right. It's always right to be right. Um, I think we are fortunate that we have leadership. I think both Molly and Heidi have inserted themselves in statewide groups to help us learn more and to help us figure out if there are things we need to change up, what are those things that will be most successful? So I think we're appreciative of that. And Commissioner, I know that we um, we take the race piece and the equality piece very seriously. And um, I will tell you that even within the last six months, we have become significantly more diverse in our clientele than we were the last three and a half years. And partly that's due to what Bryce uh, has talked about and with Heidi's work. You know, it, you see a name, John Doe, and you see an offense, and it's easy regardless, and most of the time we don't even know the race of the person, mm -hmm. to say that they're, they won't fit the program. But it's amazing once you actually delve into who they are, where they've come from, what they've endured, kind of their high risk, high need, et cetera. Um, I, I think that, you know, Bryce, on behalf of the law enforcement, has done a really nice job also um, being more versatile. And, you know, maybe three years ago when the county attorney's office would simply just say no, now there are at least discussions as to what if and could we move in this direction and are they right for the program. And so, like anything, um, we have really grown as a program in, in those regards too, whether it's veterans court or treatment court, and our intent is just to get more diverse. Well, and I, I would just add, it's, it's always hard to really know somebody without knowing their story. Yep. And every one of us in this room has a story. Everyone out there has a story. But I also know it's incredibly messy and time consuming because I don't, I know I don't have to tell anybody. Just seeing you yesterday, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? I mean, it's, it's time consuming, but until you get to that point, it's just cookie cutters and humans aren't cookie cutters. 
Exactly. Uh, but systems operate sort of tend to as cookie cutters, and so that that was just my point. I just like, That's hey, it is always right to do right. You never right hear anything right. different. Um, but I'm also like, let's not. I don't want let somebody else fall into those political narratives. Like, let's, let's do the right thing. Let's do and the right thing. And I know right that thing. we are. So I just wanted. To That's a good transition. Doing the right thing is a good transition into a conversation about law enforcement. And Sergeant Pearson is here this morning. We're grateful for that. Um, I'd like to go to slide. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, and so, um, uh, Heidi, could you walk through the data and then we have some questions for uh, the sergeant. So this data is um, on law enforcement checks that were done on all accepted participants. Um, and then it's broken down kind of between police departments, the number of checks each department has done. And then it's also broken down by our current active participants, our graduates and our terminated participants for numbers that um, they had for curfew checks. And I can let Sergeant Pearson talk a little bit more. Um, when we say curfew checks, it's much more than that. We're very fortunate to have the partnerships we do and that's a huge part to the work that Sergeant Pearson has done in building relationships with these other departments. Um, so yes, the term is curfew check, but a lot of these officers come and they really engage with the participants, check in on them, how they're doing, um, what do they need? I'm always here if you need anything. I know Shakopee has been great at, you know, even giving rides to UAs or appointments, um, job referrals, things like that. So I'll let Sergeant Pearson talk a little bit more about the law enforcement relationship. But I mean, as you can see, we've had <clears throat> over 2000 checks done um, with our law enforcement partners on participants in our program. And it's been a huge piece um, to the success, I believe. Um, yes, so uh, the biggest thing is the relate, building the relationships with the participants, obviously. You're knocking on their door at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're sleeping. They're irritated that we woke them up because they work at 6 the next morning. Um, but the, the judges, judges both have done a very nice job in sending the message that you will answer your door, you'll be respectful, and you'll have that conversation. So I think it goes back to just all the teamwork and, and all that. Um, it's an opportunity for us to, like Heidi said, really get to know these people. The participants, some of them are more engaging than others. Um, some of them latch on to the idea quicker. Some of them never do. Um, there's some participants that may never uh, you know, really engage in that relationship beyond graduation. Um, I could sit here and tell you stories about relationships I have with the participants um, who have graduated and I still keep in touch with them, have coffee with them, call them once a month, whatever it is. Um, every officer that's doing these has a different take on it. There's, there's a huge buy-in piece. You have some officers that are going to knock on the door. Yep, you're here. Okay, have a good night. And that's going to be the extent of it. Then there's going to be others who really go the extra mile and, you know, build a relationship and do things like offer rides to UAs if they don't have that driver's license or um, things like that. So I think it's pretty, um, it's pretty up to the officer how far they want that relationship to go. Um, I came off patrol about a year ago, I'm in investigations now, and I'm certain that's why Shakopee doesn't have the most curfew checks. <laughs> um, but that's the one thing I miss most is doing those checks at, you know, midnight, two o'clock in the morning. Um, I don't know if anyone has specific questions about, you know, what else that entails. Um, that's just kind of a general overview of what that looks like. So, Jamie, or Sergeant Pearson, um, can you talk about what's the variation in the checks that are done by different officers, and do we have enough data to develop any kind of a correlation between uh, how many checks or the type of checks that are done and uh, graduation or other elements that are improved within the uh, program? Um, you know, when you look at this, this data in front of you, you'll see, I, and my eyes aren't great, I don't have that in front of me, but I'll just say Belt Plain, for example, they do a wonderful job of consistently checking on their folks. 
Um, I think one thing that we could do better as a group is uh, just really under, getting the other agencies to understand the phases of our program. Someone who's in phase five about ready to graduate does not need to be checked on four times a week. Our goal is to put them back into the community and not need to rely on a cop knocking on their door four times a week to make sure they're there and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Obviously, we're grateful for the checks that are done. And hold, there's, there's a huge accountability piece to that. Um, but I think uh, if, we, if we, as every agency together, would understand, I think the, the phase is a little bit better, I think um, that would be helpful. Um, I don't know if I really answered your question, but. Well, and to speak to Sergeant Pearson's point too, um, prior to COVID, we were going out um, and trying to get into the chief meetings to talk to police departments about our program and kind of the curfew check aspect. Um, we were able to make it out to Savage for a chief meeting, but then obviously life circumstances happened and we're not going out and about right now. As far as data um, for success um, versus not, I mean, as you can see, the graduates um, do have a higher percentage of law enforcement checks, um, but that's also due to the fact that our graduates are home doing well. A lot of the terminated people are on warrant status and not able to be checked on. Um, we could probably dig a little deeper into the type of checks because we do, you know, the officers do a great job of documenting a conversation that they had or what the interaction was like. So we could definitely um, look at pulling out more data on meaningful conversations versus checks and kind of see where that lands. So that could be something we could definitely look at for future. I mean, that's something to note too. I mean, when, you're, when we're going out there and visiting with these people, a lot of times, you know, in the beginning, it's a curfew check. So you're going there to make sure they're there, you know, document your observations on their level of sobriety. But as you get to know these people, it becomes more than just a curfew check. Um, I can only speak for myself, but there's participants where, yeah, it's a curfew check, but I'm also going there because I enjoy visiting with them. I want to see what they're up to. So, I mean, it kind of, it, it turns into more than just a curfew check if, if that relationship is, you know, established at some point. Well, and this piece is one of the things that makes our treatment court different. So many treatment courts don't have law enforcement buy-in. They don't have curfew checks. They don't, they just don't have it. Their police officers don't believe in it or their relationship is not as strong, et cetera. Um, this is one of the pieces that makes us successful, period. When you have police officers that go and sit on a couch and have a 15 minute chat with somebody and then they get up and leave, I mean, I can't tell you how many participants have looked at Judge Lennon and I and they'll say, literally, they'll look at me and say, and then the police officer just walked out. I didn't get arrested. They didn't search my house. They, they just walked out. And, you know, um, and a number of you have um, come to graduations in the past, and you've seen actual police officers hug participants. I mean, when we started this program, that is something that never crossed my brain, that we would have a participant hug a police officer at the end and thank them. You know, it, it's... When the participants usually come in, they don't like the lawyers, they don't like the judges, they don't like the courthouse, they surely don't like the police officers. And yet, our graduates come in and graduate and look around and they're so thankful. And the biggest piece, or one of the biggest pieces, is with the police officers. Um, and so that's been, you know, this is kind of the cornerstone or one of the cornerstones of, of our program that makes us different. And a lot of that success is from Sergeant Pearson and breaking down those barriers because there are a lot of cops that will look and say, you know, this program's garbage. You're just letting the bad guys out and they don't see the value in changing human beings, especially our 19-year-olds and our 22-year-olds. Um, but Sergeant Pearson has done uh, tireless work and as has have a couple of our deputies in the Sheriff's Department who believe in it and uh, it's made all the difference in the world. Question. Uh, Sergeant Pearson, thanks for being here and thanks for all you've done. We've seen your work. Um, one thing I would add from, you know, I'll speak for myself, but I'll kind of speak for my colleagues too. When there's opportunities for a need to um, politically educate and change minds, whether it be with some of the city councils or mayors, 
we, you know, who do have some influence sometimes with the chief in those towns, let us know because obviously we're believers in this program and we're sitting here, we can't do the work. You guys are doing all the great work, you know, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to sit here and hear, hear how, how good you guys are, you know, it's like you're important to us, like, well, you're doing all that work, but calling us for help when, when you need us, when we can be helpful. Um, and then second, my question for you, just because I think it'd be great for all of us to hear, and especially our, our viewers, and, and I, I know you'll, you'll have something to say about this. How has your participation in, this, in these programs made you a better officer? It's a good question. So um, I, I won't sit here and tell you my life story, but I have always kind of needed something to um, grab onto and have a passion for alongside of my day-to-day -day duties of being a cop. Um, so, you know, I was a dare officer for a while. That was kind of my, my passion at that time in my career. This opportunity came along, and um, I think coming into this, I remember um, the prior, former prior lake chief came and talked to our sergeant group and kind of told us that this program or opportunity was coming to Scott County, and um, kind of laid it all out in front of us, and my first, my first response was the same response that I get from most of my partners and other officers was, this is never going to work. This is a slap on the wrist for these people. There's no way. And then he kind of started giving his presentation, and I was like thinking to myself, well, maybe this could work. Um, I don't know if it was just the way he presented it, or what? And then um, I don't remember exactly like, if I came to court and saw it, or I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I don't remember exactly what it was, but um, I had heard that he was going to be stepping away, and so I reached out to him and just kind of said, "Hey, I, I I would like this opportunity if my chief agrees to it, and we can work it all out." Um, these people have problems, just like the rest of us. Everybody has problems. Nobody's perfect. Um, and I think that's been the biggest eye-opening piece for me, and it translates to other areas of my job, obviously, is just because they have a drug problem doesn't mean they're a bad person. Um, they maybe committed that burglary or that shoplifting or theft or whatever it is to support that drug habit. You, you, you get rid of that drug habit, and maybe they won't steal anymore. Maybe they won't burglarize their parents' house, you know? Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for me is just really recognizing that these really are good people once you get to know them and you get them the services that they need. And they got to want it, though. I mean, you can't force it on them. They got to want it. And it, it works. We've all seen it. Single-handedly, it works. If they want it, it'll work. So I'm going to dovetail on that because... What you just said is they have to want it. Um, so w w whether it's this or Child Protective Services or whatever, I always think about, okay, you guys are the front lines of this thing. And we've all been in situations where we want something so badly for somebody else, but they don't. And there's nothing you can do about it. How does that impact all of you? Because um, that's the other side of this. Like, it's messy, right? We're getting into the stuff of life. And you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but they can't. Um, getting goosebumps thinking about it, because we've all known those people where whatever it is you want, but until they want it, until the timing, whatever you want to call it, um, how does that impact you um, moving I, forward? I think I can take this one. Uh, this is Judge Lennon. Um, it's like parenting. Oh, oh. So much like parenting. I can't even tell you. I have more children now than I ever have. And sometimes they disappoint me. And I remind myself what I still like about them. And it is shocking how attached. Oh. That sounds unprofessional. But it's that how much I care about these kids. And I call them kids. They're adults. But I call them kids. And because I see both of those sides and you can want and want and want change for someone and you can encourage them as much as you can. And at some point they're still gonna make another mistake. But I, I had a mother 
come to me, or she might have been the grandma, came to me at a graduation and she said, you know, you sent Jordan to prison four years ago. And I was just shocked. I didn't remember it at all. And, and she said, but you know what? That's what he needed at that time. And then when he came out, he was ready to do this program. And you kind of, you said something to him at the time about he needed to, to really sit down and reflect what he was doing. And that, and that, that, that kind of tough love portion of the process still worked. He wasn't an immediate success, but ultimately he succeeded. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to, you have to look at the, the long game. You know, it, it's hard, but it is, it is definitely, and I think they feel that connection when mm. they say the judge really cares about what happens to me and all the research says that's important. Oh. And mm -hmm. so that's what we do, but I'll tell you what, I am never more tired than on Monday night. Whew. <laughs> Exhausting. Well, and the other piece to that is, is that, you know, we screen people to come in, but we also kick people out. Sure. We don't, it's not, you get in and you can just have at it. Um, at some point, we are very cognizant of the fact that these are valuable resources and we work so hard and you're exactly right. I can't tell you how much, how many times I would look at Judge Lennon and say, I just want them to get this right. How many times can we do X, Y, and Z? You know, and yet sometimes it takes two treatments. Other people, it's taken 17 treatments oh. to get them to where they want to be. And we figure out kind of as we go whether this is the right time. And, and for some of it's not. And for some of them, we terminate them, we send them, and we hope that when they're older, more mature, ready, whatever it is in their life. Um, but I'll tell you, we all look in the mirror and say, did we do everything we possibly could? Have we done every service? Have we, is there anything we haven't shaken loose? And if the answer is we've done it all, and they've been in program for 18, 20, 25 months, et cetera, and they haven't made progress, then it's time. Yeah. Well, in Judge Lennon, I wanted to say one thing. You mentioned it sounds unprofessional. Um, I thought it sounded very human, very awesome. And I know, and I know, that's, what, I know that's what you meant. But, I mean, that's the human side, right? We all want the best yeah. for, for everybody. Um, so that was my dovetail, because Commissioner Weckman Breck, you kind of brought that up. I was going to start kind of in the beginning part of it is, like, because I, I, Judge Walton, I've been in your courtroom, yes. zoomed in or whatever, and uh, you know you come down off the ivory tower. I know you don't see it that way, but man, I pucker up when I walk into a courtroom for the Christmas uh, get together. You know, there's something about like, oh, am I sitting up straight? Am I? Um, so there's something about that courtroom which you you, know, you really you know bring that down to, to level. Um, but when somebody else, especially in a robe or somebody in some position, attorneys say, you know what, I see something in you. When you don't see, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I mean, there's power there. And then I've got the, the 5 0 knocking on my door, yep. and they're not hauling me out. And some I know are, are, you know, see it better than others or whatever, but want to spend the time and, hey, let's go do this. You need a ride or whatever. Like, well, and on top of powerful. that, right. And on powerful. top of that, your probation officer actually knows your name, they know your kids, they know your story, they converse with you a couple times a day. I mean, it is. You know, it's that wraparound deal. Oh. And, and it is, and that is why we succeed. Because if we just sent them treatment and then plopped them right back in the same spot and said, hope it works, it doesn't work. What always makes me nervous is the then what? Okay, you're on, what, what did you say? I don't know, what was something five or phase five or whatever. You're kind of on like, you know, the fish is kind of out of the net. Yep. Like it's going to take, up. where's it going? You know, which I think to some extent was John's question, you know, what's the next step? Like, we've, we've seen people that have been, you know, we, we've come in, you're in the embrace, you know, we're here for you, man, we're going to mm, do what we can, but ultimately it's your choice. But now it's time to spread your wings, and now where are they going to? That's the other thing that keeps me up at night. Well, and like Judge Lennon said, though, they're like kids, oh. right? When you send your kid to college at 18, they, they then have... Complete freedom. You hope you raised them right. Yep. But the thing we do in treatment court also is we graduate them, but then we have them continue to come back and see us over a period of months, just check-ins. Yeah. And so kind of like the co your college kid that comes back and, you know, in October they come back or December and you're like, okay, let's see your grades. How you doing? Do you look good? Do you sound good? Um, and if there's potential for relapse, et cetera, we bring them right back in to get them to where they need to be. 
Well, I just hope you guys are taking care of your own hearts in all of this is a big part of it. Because, yes, there's boundaries. We all have to set them. Um, and ultimately, it's their choice. It's just, you know, when you see somebody, just please make sure you're taking care of yourself in this, too. Thank you. Let's, let's look at how those folks are doing after they leave. So the slide in front of you looks at the I, You were just, you were well just like teeing well them up. You know, it's good. Um, so um, the slide in front of you has the recidivism data for people um, in treatment court. Um, this is treatment court only. This is, does not include any data from vets court, obviously, since that's a new program. Um, Heidi, can you just walk through this data, and then I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, so the graphs on the left um, for graduates and terminations, those that reflects the number of participants that obtained an offense while they were active under drug court supervision. So out of graduates, we had two graduates obtain some sort of new offense um, while active in the program. And then out of the 23 that were terminated, 12 of those participants obtained at least one new offense while in the program. And then on the right-hand side, it's the reflection after one year. So um, just due to our time, um, the average length it takes a participant to graduate is you know, around 22 months. So we really didn't have any graduates until year two of the program. So right now, um, we have about five that have been fully out for one year, but about all the 21 graduates, only one person right now has obtained an offense, and it was a gross misdemeanor drug possession offense, and he actually came into our relapse track. Um, so that is one new thing we also developed since last presenting, is we now incorporated a relapse track. So because we monitor the graduates for six months um, after graduation, if they were to you know, report use, have a positive UA, um, struggling in some sort, picked up a new offense, we have the option um, to put them into a relapse track, which is basically a modified version of treatment court. It's kind of an additional six month period where we have them come back in for check-ins, meet more frequently with probation again, kind of do the, everything they were doing in treatment court um, to hopefully quickly get them back on track um, where they wouldn't need a full length program again. Um, and then out of the 23 terminated participants, seven of them have obtained at least one offense um, since being terminated from the program. So as you can see, um, I mean, our graduates are doing very well so far um, with only one obtaining an offense since graduation. Thanks, Heidi. So um, I, you know, I, I really celebrate your success and I, I think that you should feel um, terrific about this work. I do think it begs the question because this is a this is a big investment, a big financial investment for the county, and it's a small number of people that have been served so far, and more will come. But I, I'd like people to talk about like what's your best evidence that this is where our resources should go going forward. I'll start with that one. Interesting that COVID hit in March, um, and so you could never conduct a science experiment with human beings like this. So in February, all the things you just heard about were in place. We drug test people two to five times a week. We curfew check them. They come to court. They meet with their probation officer. Their probation officer goes out to their house. They're in real person treatment face-to-face. Um, -face. They're doing all the things that we want them to do. And across the board, both of our treatment courts were doing extremely well. Um, winter is always tough for our addicts. And so coming out of winter into spring, things looked really good. Then COVID hits. And we tell them, you now need to isolate. Our drug testing shut down. Our police officers couldn't go in the house anymore. We held virtual court. Um, probation officers couldn't go to their house anymore. Their meetings and et cetera were all virtual. Over 90% of my people in four months relapsed. Almost 90 or over 90%. When you take away what we have put in place, this is what happens. And so I could never come to you and tell you, boy, your money is being well spent. Look at all the successes. It's hard once you put everything in place, you would never have a control group that you would just yank away and say, now let's see how these people are going to do because we're dealing with human beings. 
Interestingly enough, once the courts opened back up again, drug testing got back in place, meetings, probation officers, everything else, my people went from this to all the way up. We had in March our first overdose death of one of my participants. He appeared virtually on a Monday afternoon. I watched him and looked at him and talked to him at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. By the next day, the next night, he was dead. His name is Andrew Maxa. And he overdosed. And we thought he was sober the whole time. He had done so well. Great young man. Had turned his life around. And when you take everything away, this is what we revert, we, we revert back to. When we started treatment court four or five years ago, and we talked to you guys, and we talked to other people, um, we had a, all of our drug people continue to fill up our jail over and over and over. It was just this revolving door of jail bed, jail bed, jail bed. I look at the high risk, high need people that we deal with, and, and Chris, you're right. Relatively speaking, this is a small number. But it's like anything else. When I was a prosecutor in Ramsey County, we talked about the people that were filling up um, the uh, emergency area of overdose, etc. Um, and it was like nine people that were there 70% of the time. If you just took those nine people out, the numbers would be real nice and low. And that's what I would tell you about our drug court participants. Because of the services we put in place, these high risk, high need people are staying out of jail. They're getting the mental health. Dr. Schultz screens every single one of them. And that's the other gigantic piece that, that frankly you guys have given us, which is a psychologist for mental health that sits on our team. It is invaluable to hear once she does a diagnostic assessment to what this person's needs are. And so we deal with their mental health. Without this program, I guarantee you that our jails would be full and we would be running again, cycling through. The families would be cycling through. Uh, the amount of money spent to deal with all these human beings would be gigantic. Um, and so, yes, it's a small number of people, but as Commissioner Beer, you've pointed out over and over, and, and you and I see exactly the same on this, these are human beings. And so, if there are only 20 human beings that we take and we make them law-abiding citizens, sober, make their families get back intact, that they get a job, they pay taxes, and they don't burden the system, and in fact, they enhance our system, what's the value? And to me, you can put a monetary value on it, but really it's priceless. Because now for generations, we, you, have done something to alter the course of history in, in each human being. You're welcome. Can I ask? So, the, in March, they just went downhill because there was, it was no structure for these, right? That's exactly right. We took away all the precautions. So, is, do you think a lot of this starts just, they had no structure their entire lives, possibly, that caused all this? Commissioner, I think that what, what, what happens is, is you get this cycle where um, your life, as, as all my drug court participants would describe their lives, it's chaos. It's where am I going to find my drugs? What am I going to steal? Where am I going to couch surf? Am I going to sleep? I mean, we've had participants talk about them going into bathrooms at gas stations and sleeping overnight in the bathroom or sleeping overnight next to a building curled up because they have nowhere else to go. And so their lives are unstructured. They wake up, they look for drugs. They steal, they do whatever they have to, then they go to sleep, then they wake up, and they look for more drugs. And so I think once COVID hit, it was chaos. And, and we told them to isolate. Don't hang around people. Stay by yourself. And any addict will tell you the worst thing they can do is A, be bored, B, be isolated. And I asked a lot of these participants, how do you know you're going to move to a relapse? I start isolating. I don't talk to my family anymore. I don't talk to my friends. I stay in my house. I, I just withdraw. And so we almost force them, based on the pandemic, to do and put themselves right back in that spot. And the statistics were, I just, I, I literally, between March, April, and May, I kept looking at my sheets every week thinking, you've got to be kidding me. 
Like every single person is going down the hill. And then once the lights get turned back on and we start moving back and get drug testing again and everything else, the numbers, they just come right back up. I, Judge Walton, I think also a very important piece of this is um, trauma. And it hasn't really been discussed, but it, it kind of went into a few of the conversations that we've been having. But a lot of our participants have a lot of trauma in their past. And, you know, COVID also took away their mental health services. So I think that that was also a big piece. Um, when you have a lot of trauma like that, and you have given up hope on yourself, and then we t bring you in, try to give you hope back for yourself, put in place a lot of services, and then take those services away, you take away their hope again. Thanks, Michelle. Well, I, would, I just would add I, it, that this is true for all of folks on probation. We saw high relapse rates, right? I mean, that's just the, the essence of the pandemic. And so, um, so you're absolutely right. I just echo and support what people are saying around that. I think it's, um, it's definitely uh, a struggle when you, when you have all those supports and then you take that away from anyone. Yep. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to hand it back to you for any other questions from the board. Thank you very much. Boy, I felt like we were just getting started. And I know, I know. <laughs> well, so I, much. I, so I, much. Isn't it good? It is. It's really interesting. I know we're late on time, but I, I think I want to bring this up because I, I would like a reminder for us and then to allow you to have some input and discussion. Um, you know, I, I really liked in the, the materials how you talked about changes since the grant going off and being county funded. You know, from, from our seats, we like it that it was grant funded, but it's nice to see that we can do even better when, when we're controlling the, the funding. Um, and I, I think there's been some discussion about, and, and maybe even sometimes some, some tension about, does the person who's being served have to reside in Scott County what does it mean? Do they reside in Scott County? Where's that at for both treatment court and veterans court? Any thoughts you want to talk to us about that, that issue? And, and that's a good question. And, and we have stayed true to kind of what we promised four years ago, which was if you gave us the money, um, we would serve Scott County residents. And all of you know and are very well aware that a lot of our traffic comes from Mystic Lake. They're Hennepin County. They're all over the place. Um, and, and so we have not had any problems filling our drug courts with Scott County residents. And we've got a great policy on homelessness. We make them meet three of the criteria to have some connection to, to Scott County. I think the veteran piece um, is a little bit different. And, um, you know, if you're a Hennepin County resident, Hennepin County generally has a treatment court. And so does Ramsey, and so does Dakota, and so does all these other places. But the veterans courts are fewer and far between. Um, and so we are still in that stage of trying to figure out how we can serve the most veterans possible um, that, that come into Scott County. And it's made a little bit difficult because we have a probation officer that's here. And so if somebody from Moorhead gets arrested, and they're a veteran, would I love to have them in our veterans court? Yes. But logistically, that's an impossibility. Um, and so I think with our veterans, we're trying to, trying to be a little bit wider and a little, give a little more leeway to people that are at least on the fringes of Scott County, um, if they've committed a crime here, to be able to bring them in. I think one of the challenges we have on the probation side is there's statewide policy that, that also speaks to when and how quickly we need to transfer probation back into the county in which they reside. So we have some competing things going on there as well that we are working through and talking through as we staff cases, yeah. And, and I'd just like to chime in here on this from a Veterans Court perspective. That's probably been the most um, interesting part I've learned in the last 11 months and perhaps most frustrating, and I don't think it's anybody on this meeting's fault, but we do have situations where we have clients, potential participants who are just over the border into Dakota County, uh, LeSueur County, and 
are right for the program and we can do good for them. Um, but we have those barriers as indicated. And um, I don't know if that's a legislative change. I agree probation's working through that, but that's certainly something that um, I think as a whole and something that we need to try to find a way to address. And uh, just one final thing on that one unique issue that I think we run into in the vets court program is obviously we're trying to help these people find housing. And we've had multiple people come through our program who were not housed when they began the program and then obtained housing in a different county. Um, and all the problems that probation has set about being able to supervise them come up in that situation too. Uh, and so it's difficult how we, from our end, we decide whether we accept these people because they're originally homeless or because they were living in Scott County, but then they do obtain stable housing in another county. That's what we're asking them to do, but then it's difficult for us to supervise them or impossible at that point. Uh, so simply the lack of available housing for these people on HUD bash vouchers, which they get through the VA uh, in Scott County is a real problem and causes us to lose a lot of participants. So I have a question. This is John Ulrich, uh, Commissioner. Um, what would it mean if, and I'd probably get in trouble with some for asking this question, what would it mean if, uh, to you, if, you, if there was uh, one or two houses uh, on Marshall Road, walkable to the transit station that were maybe supportive housing. Would, would you be able to make good use of those houses or, or how, how important would that be as a tool in your, uh, in your work? Commissioner, we would fill it if you built it. And I'll retire and manage it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt that it would be full, Commissioner, with treatment courts and with, beyond that as well with reentry. Okay, thank you. For the record, he's not getting in trouble for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else online or in studio, so to speak? Um, otherwise, I would just say, look, I mean, I don't know everybody on digital, you know, or everyone here, but probably not looking for a job. Right, you, you're feeling these. You're not raising your hand to do some of this dirty work because you know. So I see this oftentimes as a calling. So you've kind of been wired and built for this. But as you pour yourself out into and onto the lives of others, I would just hope and pray that you are also being filled and poured into somehow, some way. Because um, it's impossible, in my opinion, to pour, 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 and give, give, give. And I'm all about tough love. Uh, um, but without getting that cup refilled somehow some way so i just hope uh, that that is happening so I, I also wanted to thank sergeant pearson and, and judge wilton and, and all of you for coming today um i did sit in those original work sessions five or six years ago when they came and i still have embedded in my head the three legs of the stool right the addiction the um, mental health treatment and I know we didn't hear much from <laughs> the doctor today, but we have in the past. And then the, um, the uh, police that, and being involved or those, those checks and how important they were sitting in your first graduation and, and talking about the impact that had. And I, I'm just really thrilled that when I look at this that I still see that's intact. And, you know, Commissioner Beard talked earlier about it takes time to meet people and learn stories, but that was the other thing that was talked about, that the judge, the attorney, the uh, law enforcement officer would be assigned and be consistent and they would take the time to learn those stories. And clearly with that intact, with those other addiction and mental health treatments intact, it seems to be successful in your transitioning the lives of these people. And so it is encouraging to see that five or six years later, what you brought forward and if we could stick to this formula of best practices um, that you would make progress. So thank you both and all of you for being here today. Um, it's just great news. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we have historically invited the treatment court to come annually to the to the Scott Delivers programs. We expect to do that next year unless we hear differently from you. Um, a big thank you to the people that are remote. This is a really tough way to have this conversation and they're a pretty tight team. So it's hard to have half of them um, somewhere else. But thanks to all of you. Now, I just wanted to note that they look pretty comfortable. I can see their faces. 
Uh, I'm, I'm starting to think that that looks super. <laughs> um, that they may be the smart ones. Well, yeah. I mean, so that you heard, that Leslie's looking at me. Yeah, you heard that from me. That's, that's the work session discussion. So, um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.